and also uh, on our KBC app, we are live. And uh, of course, the United Nations Environment Program offices are here are situated right here in the country of course we will be we'll be getting into that and they are also celebrating 50 years uh, we'll be getting deeper into that but without further ado let me welcome dr juliet biao uh, karibu sana kenya yes asante <laughs> should i say asante <laughs> oh, bonjour <laughs> bonjour ah, even better yeah. now united nations environment program is situated right here in uh, our country kenya and uh, you are having the fifth united nations environment assembly yesterday you did an interview there was an interview a press conference actually uh, in regard to the summit perhaps we can first of all listen to that then we can get deeper into the fifth united nations environment assembly uh, summit right Okay, um, I'm informed uh, it's uh, not yet ready, but uh, perhaps you can uh, start us off with the theme of this year's summit. Thank you so much, uh, Ben, for inviting me. Um, this United Nations Environment uh, Assembly is the fifth one, and it's being held under the theme Strengthening Actions for Nature to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, nobody has predicted the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, studies really reported that this is happening because something has been broken between people and nature. And this United Nations Environment Assembly offers an opportunity for people to make peace with nature. Mm -hmm. So uh, it will really focus on how we can, environment can play a, key, a central role to address the three crises, climate, nature, pollution. So, uh, this is why um, this um, uh, session is particularly important because we need to prevent people from future pandemics. We need to prevent people for future shock. Uh -huh. And of course, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has, of course, changed how we are approaching the environment <coughs> conservation. And of course, it has hindered some efforts of uh, environment conservation. But before then, uh, it w the, the PS yesterday did talk about something quite dire, that the country needs a lot of money when it comes to environment conservation, because uh, we have really polluted our environment. But before then, let's first of all listen to that clip, then we get back to the discussion. These are huge resources, but what are these adaptation uh, measures and mitigation measures? One of them is to ensure that we address degraded forests. But as a matter of policy under the 10 percent tree cover, we are now saying all infrastructure must be green. So as you do your infrastructure, you must make sure that you also provide for greening. We have to balance. We need settlement, we need land for infrastructure, but we also need forests. All our 2.5 million, 2.59 million hectares under KFS. You will see that there's been a lot of pressure for land for schools, land for this, land for that. What we have proposed to member states in terms of our strategic priority areas are three folds. One is climate change, second is nature, third is chemicals and pollution. We are thrilled that in all those three areas, Kenya has demonstrated as a host country, but equally as a member state, strong leadership. Yesterday, the PSD talked about the country needs about $60 billion for environmental conservation. And looking at what is happening right now in the country, we've seen rising water levels, and especially on our lakes. It's a big problem in the country. $60 billion is a lot of money, and especially for a third world country. Yes, I concur with the doctor, I think it's Dr. Kipto, yes, who, Dr. Who, who really mentioned that the country needs money. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's really kind of uh, surprising mm -hmm. when we jump into talking about the need for money. Mm -hmm. First thing, 
is about behaviors and mentalities. Uh -huh. You know why we find ourselves in this situation of need of money? Mm -hmm. It's because, you know, um, the, co the cost for inaction is what, brought, what has brought us to this situation today. But if we really work on preventive measures, mm -hmm. you will find that, you know, the cost for a curative action mm -hmm. will be less than what we're talking today. Mm -hmm. While we're trying to recover from COVID-19, addressing this conservation issue, mm -hmm. I think the big lesson we should learn is how do we really act in a preventive mode mm -hmm. than, really, than in a curative mode? Mm -hmm. Yes, today uh, the, the, the damage the damage is, is, is so big that we need such a big amount of money really to recover. But by recovering, we will also at the same time really build the resilience for, for really to prevent future pandemics and also to, to address, to, 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 to continue mm -hmm. this transformation that we, we've, we've, been, we've been doing mm -hmm. by making uh, the environmental dimension mm -hmm. a central component of this transformation. Indeed, you've brought up a very interesting uh, topic, uh, talking about, it's not about the money for now. Mm. Let's first of all put money aside. Mm. It's us. We begin with ourselves yep. from conserving our own environment. What are some mm. of the things that uh, make you say that uh, we, also, we first of all need to befriend nature? How can we do that? Bef before no. we think about uh, the figures. You, you, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. we need to fix, we need to address the issues now, particularly mm -hmm. uh, looking at recovering from COVID-19. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, mm -hmm. we need to learn a lesson that really um, we need going forward to respect nature. We need to change our behaviors. Uh, toward nature. We need really to change our mentality. That, in the future, would reduce the cost for really uh, uh, the conservation measures that mm -hmm. we are taking today. Mm -hmm. And how have COVID-19 affected or hindered efforts in, um, any efforts in environmental conservation? Because this is, this is a new, uh, talking about uh, perhaps two, three years ago, we didn't have the COVID-19 pandemic, and we also had challenges in uh, conserving our environment. How was COVID-19 pandemic? Of course, there's the time that we all are in our houses, and uh, of course, uh, that cannot be very good when it comes to environment conservation. How has COVID-19 changed that? Um, it will be a mistake if we say that uh, COVID-19 has directly changed, you know, this uh, uh, ability to conserve the nature. Mm -hmm. But uh, well, it, well, there's a fact there mm -hmm. where, you know, COVID-19 mm -hmm. really has compromises the ability of nations and communities really to manage the nature in a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. um, COVID-19 ha has really uh, helped us to really figure out our fragility, mm -hmm. even from health perspective. And you see, when uh, communities and nations found themselves in this kind of situation, especially in Africa, mm -hmm. and when they are hit hard, mm -hmm. they go back to nature, again, the nature. So um, I think uh, going forward, as I said, reconciling with nature, respecting more the nature uh, and, uh, and uh, managing the, the nature in a more sustainable way will help us overcome the difficulty we are. We are, we are, we are facing today. Of course, there is, there is a lot of uh, pollution and especially in Africa, comparing how the, the situation that we have in, the, in Africa uh, from the rest of the world. How is it here in Africa? Look, Pollution is, is, is the biggest killer, you know? Uh, I, I think globally, mm -hmm. uh, uh, pollution kills about uh, 7 million people annually. In Africa alone, every year, pollution kills 
over 600,000 people wow. annually. Uh, but what, what we should be really fearing with uh, the COVID-19 is the risk for, you know, increased generation of waste, including hazardous waste in Africa. Mm -hmm. We know that, uh, you know, uh, the Bamako Convention yes. prohibiting the import in, into Africa of waste was really trying to address those issues. And we, we've seen, even during COVID-19, mm -hmm. how this uh, uh, import of hazardous waste in Africa is being escalated. Mm -hmm. The perfect example is Sierra Leone, Tunisia, and those are the, 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 the cases that have been reported. Mm -hmm. They are cases that are unreported. So, you know, this COVID-19 will really help us to, to reinforce, uh, to, to enforce the Bamako Convention mm -hmm. to avoid, you know? If we look at the waste that have been generated during COVID-19, mm -hmm. we can really fear that those waste being dumped in Africa. Yes. So we need really enforcement on the Bamako Convention mm -hmm. to preserve the health of both people and nature in Africa. And still on the Bamako Convention of 2018, mm. uh, it was about talking about uh, dumping of hazardous waste in Africa. Mm. That was exactly almost two years ago. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and now we are in uh, it's two years down the line. Yeah. Have we experienced any successes in the same? Yes, I have to say that uh, we, are, uh, we are seeing some successes. What you mentioned in 2018 was the, the third COP, the third conference of the parties to the Bamako Convention. Yes. This just two years. Uh -huh. uh, yes, the good news, uh, uh, even though we are seeing this uh, escalating generation of waste in Africa, mm -hmm. we have also seen the recommitment of African nations to this convention. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we have three countries that have ratified okay. from, from 2018. We have Morocco joining recently. Uh -huh. We have uh, uh, Central uh, African Republic. Uh -huh. We also have um, um, the, there is another country that have joined also uh -huh. uh, recently. Uh, there are three, uh -huh. just in two years. Uh -huh. If that recommitment can continue, I think we will preserve the health of both environment uh -huh. and people in Africa. Unfortunately, Kenya, is hosting the UNEP offices and hasn't signed it. But uh, away from that... It's not only Kenya. Yes, it's there a lot are of three giants that we are really engaging with. Uh -huh. Those are Kenya, yes. uh, South Africa, uh -huh. and also Nigeria. Uh -huh. I think this is not to say that other countries are not important. Yes. I'm looking at you know the, the volume of the, the, the waste that are, uh, are generated. Mm -hmm. uh, so if Kenya in particular, which is really a, a, the, the, what I, I will say, the world environmental uh, uh, kind of... Uh, um, because the, the Kenya is hosting yes. really the, the, the United Nations Environment uh, uh, Program, mm -hmm. I think uh, people are really watching. Yes. Yeah, Kenya. Yes. And if Kenya can really join the Bamako Convention, yes. that will be fantastic. In, in the in the post uh, uh, post COVID uh, recovery phase, uh -huh. and uh, I saw your interview that, uh, two years ago on the same. Uh, unfortunately, it was in French. I, I just got a few words, mm. but uh, something was evident: is that the Africa has become. A, a dumping site for hazardous mm. waste and that is why you held the Bamako Convention and um, perhaps what are some of these waste that are dumped here and who are responsible for dumping all this here in Africa because if we had a summit and talking about Africa matters and hazardous dumping of or it's our own problem as Africans yes I, I think uh, what uh, I used to say when I, I have the opportunity to do so mm. is that you know, we should not really waste our time blaming, you mm -hmm. know, those nations yes. which are dumping the waste in our country. Mm -hmm. We should blame ourselves, not enforcing the, the convention, not enforcing the law. Mm -hmm. If the law are enforced, 
I think we should find a way to reject those ways. Mm -hmm. And it takes also a certain level of awareness mm -hmm. of countries to get there. Mm -hmm. This is what we are, we are currently doing as interested secretariat of the Bamako Convention. Uh -huh. Away from that, at the fifth United Nations Environment Assembly that will be held virtually on the 22nd and 23rd of this, uh, of this month. Kindly touch on some of the things that you want to achieve uh, in uh, that summit. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the United Nations Environment Assembly is the highest decision-making body on the, the global um, environment. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, meets biennially, you know, uh, to set the uh, priorities um, mm -hmm. on, on the global environment policy mm -hmm. and also on in the international law. Mm -hmm. um, this year, uh, um, member states have agreed, due to COVID-19, to, to take a two-step approach. Mm -hmm. uh, an online, online session that will be held from 22nd to 23rd of February mm -hmm. will really um, uh, kind of uh, address urgent matters, uh, including uh, approving the, uh, the medium cent strategy the program of work and the budget. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the online session. Uh, but during the, the same online session, mm -hmm. um, UNEP will be also launching mm -hmm. a synthesis report on uh, um, uh, making peace with nature. Mm -hmm. um, at the same, it is very, a very comprehensive uh, blueprint to address those three key. Uh, priorities that I've mentioned earlier, climate change, nature, and pollution. Um, during the same online session, a leadership uh, uh, dialogue will be organized really to discuss how the environment will play a role uh, uh, to achieve sustainable development goal and also to build a resilient, a more resilient and, and inclusive post-COVID uh, world. Mm -hmm. So um, the second, I mean, uh, UNEA 2 will resume uh, in, two, in 2022, mm -hmm. uh, where member states will really discuss issues that require negotiations. Mm -hmm. And, and looking at, we have had so many summits talking about um, climate change, about um, uh, pollution, but uh, we, we keep on seeing the climate change affecting us because member states are still not adhering to what they're supposed to be adhering or to all the conventions that have, have been signed. I think we should not be uh, uh, stoning ourselves, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Although we have not seen the progress uh, uh, that we are expecting, mm -hmm. a lot is being done. And this is why it is important to, to really take the opportunity of, uh, you know, a member state moving toward uh, uh, a, a post, a, 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 the co recovery response to also kind of uh, um, look at all those innovations that are, have happened uh, during COVID-19. COVID-19 has affected us, yes, but COVID-19 also has uh, uh, offered the opportunity for us to really see where our fragility is, mm -hmm. but also the, the extent to which we have been able to adapt quickly by innovating. Yeah. yeah? So uh, uh, the progress, of course, could have been at a higher level yes. if we have not been affected by COVID-19. But uh, there are things that are being done, mm -hmm. especially in relation to our nationally determined contribution mm -hmm. on, on climate change. Countries are making so, some effort that have to be really recognized. Mm -hmm. But is that uh, the progress is not at the space really to, to counter the impact, uh, the socio-economic impact and environmental impact of the COVID-19. Uh -huh. yeah. And, and um, 
but perhaps away from that, today in the morning when listening to the news, the PS talked about here in the country, of course, there is a ban on plastic bags, but he's saying that the, the, the market is steadily rising. Is this water, watering down the efforts that we are doing to conserve nature and avoid pollution? I don't think so. I don't think that it is watering down the effort. It's just uh, that we need <laughs> to take, uh, to learn lesson from this COVID-19 and mm -hmm. see how best we can engage with businesses in this, in this, uh, mm -hmm. in this, uh, uh, you know, endeavors. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you know, um, the fact that the private sector is is all about profit, right? Yes. Uh, if we fail mm -hmm. really to demonstrate to the private sector mm -hmm. that uh, you know the ban of plastic is an opportunity mm -hmm. for them to make more profit mm -hmm. this is where uh, we will fail but i think that uh, you know by really engaging more with the with the businesses and having a dialogue it's a matter of win-win options mm -hmm. and i think that also the private sector need to understand that this planet is one planet mm -hmm. for all of us and that we are all in the in, in the same boat and should be really uh, working to toward the, the, say, the common cause. Indeed. And uh, UNEP flagship report, the, the Global Environment Outlook, the, or the GO6 uh, of 2019, uh, it was actually explaining the health of the planet. Mm. Since 2019 and now, have we achieved perhaps what we had aspired to at least to be more friendly to nature, or we still have uh, a lot of challenges in the same? I think this is where really uh, uh, UNEP is playing a central role because UNEP really doesn't raise awareness for the sake of it. Yes. UNEP brings the science to really raise awareness to say this is the status this is where we are this is the objective that we set to ourselves but the science is telling us that this is the situation if we don't act mm -hmm. and uh, you know these synthesis reports mm -hmm. on uh, uh, making peace with nature mm -hmm. will also have will tell us what has been done so far we tell the member state and the effort that need to really make peace with the nature. Mm -hmm. So uh, this uh, uh, synthesis report mm -hmm. is a comprehensive blueprint which will explain also how progressing on science and bold policy decision making mm -hmm. can really uh, 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 create a path toward achieving the sustainable development goals by uh, 2030 mm -hmm. and also a, new, a carbon neutral world by 2050. Uh -huh. And uh, looking at uh, United Nations, of course, it's a, it's, it's a magmation perhaps of uh, member states. Are you also working with the private sector perhaps because uh, they are one of the people who have been mentioned as being one of the polluters of the environment other than your member states? We cannot but working with the private sector. Mm -hmm. If you look at, uh, you know, after the uh, adoption of uh, the, uh, the Agenda 2030 and Sustainable Development Goals, mm -hmm. uh, what was done is immediately really to cost. Mm -hmm. You know, what need to be done for us to really achieve mm -hmm. the Sustainable Development Goals <sighs> is about trillions and trillions. Mm -hmm. The ODA alone, cannot really uh, 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 provide this, uh, fin uh, this financial resources, mm -hmm. then we need the private sector to fill the gap. Yes. The private sector, as I said, need to know that it is a win-win partnership. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we, ha we must work with the private sector to fill the gap. Mm -hmm. And the private sector also understand mm -hmm. that, you know, the battle is, mm -hmm. is common. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, what are some of the things that the member states uh, should uh, uh, look forward to, and especially on the fifth United Nations Environment Assembly that will be, be on in the next couple of days? I mean, 
as I mentioned earlier, for this uh, first online session, yes. uh, the priority is really to approve the medium stem strategy that sets the vision for the role of UNEP mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, the, in the coming years, and, and also uh, the, the program of work and the budget. Uh, the member state also, um, you know, by adopting the medium term strategy, mm -hmm. they also really uh, approved that, you know, the, the key areas that uh, UNEP will be fo focusing on mm -hmm. will be the climate, the nature and the pollution, really to transform finance, business and the digital space. Uh, while the implementation will still continue uh, uh, through uh, multilateralism and innovation. Uh -huh. So uh, this will, you know, <coughs> this a successful online yes. uh, uh, UNEA 5.1 mm -hmm. will be, uh, you know, what I've just mentioned. Uh -huh. Then when uh, UNEA 2 resumed in 2020, mm -hmm. you know, member states will have the opportunity to discuss the substantive matters that required negotiation. Uh -huh. yeah. And of course, we talk about survival for the fittest, but uh, right now, looking at the environment, if we continue the way we are continuing, of course, the, the, the climate change and the pollution, we will be fighting for survival for the greenest. Looking at uh, some of the uh, 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 urban companies that are, are degrading the environment, we've seen them. We've seen uh, them dumping. We've seen actually looking at Na Nairobi Le River is actually in a very dire state. And uh, looking at some of the companies that have been mentioned that they are actually polluting the environment, Co ignoring environmental conservation, could it be catastrophic at a later date, and especially uh, wording of investors who really, really, really have a problem investing in such, such companies? You know why we want to reach this uh, worst case scenario? Mm -hmm. um, given the rise in, 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 in the, the global warming, mm -hmm. given that uh, this planet is one for all of us, mm -hmm. You know, even the company at some point may need to demonstrate, you know, what are their efforts toward really uh, ensuring the, sus the, the sustainable management of our, our, our nature. And this takes really the kind of label that they will be seeking if they want to be on the global market. This will force them to join, to join us in this battle. Mm -hmm. And we also have the, really the responsibility to help them with data, with capacity building, with awareness raising for them to understand that, you know, uh, going forward, we need to work together. Mm -hmm. And of course, this summit, talking about strength, strengthening uh, actions for nature to achieve the SDGs, there are other related SDGs and especially you've talked about no poverty, zero hunger. How exactly uh, are we going to achieve this? Look, uh, um, uh, I know that if you look at the 17 uh, sustainable development goals, mm -hmm. you will see that, uh, you know, environment cut across all of them. Yes. From number one to number seven, mm -hmm. and number 17, mm -hmm. uh, environment is, is really the centrality of it. Uh, how are we going to achieve it? Um, you know, um, the world is facing this COVID-19. Mm -hmm. All the countries are drawing up, mm -hmm. if they have not done so yet, the uh, green seed stimulus package. Mm -hmm. I can speak to Africa mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as, a, as a director of, uh, you know, the regional office for Africa, mm -hmm that uh, recently, during the eighth special session of the African Ministerial Conference on the Environment, a, an African green stimulus uh, program has been adopted. Okay. This will really help, the, uh, is, is really an innovative African-led initiative uh, for the continent's uh, you know, response mm -hmm. to COVID-19. I think it's a, 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 this uh, st uh, uh, African Green uh, uh, Stimulus Program mm -hmm. uh, really propose immediate and urgent action 
uh, to tackle, uh, you know, the impact of uh, social, economic, and environmental impact of COVID-19. It also proposed uh, uh, short to medium-term interventions, while at the same time it proposed longer-term uh, 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 intervention for uh, a, a green growth entrepreneurial uh, uh, initiative and also creating of job in key sectors of, of green uh, uh, green economy this doesn't mean that uh, we are trying to reinv the african member states are trying to reinvent the wheel no this african green stimulus program is will enhance mm -hmm. the green and blue economy initiative as well as climate change initiative that are that exists so that you know member states while really uh, kind of uh, moving toward achieving the sustainable development goal they are also kind of implementing the paris agreement and uh, and all uh, all uh, multilateral agreement that uh, they, they they have ratified mm -hmm. so uh, this green uh, african green stimulus package will be really discussed by the member state how they will really in a swift manner really move uh, uh, onto the implementation. Indeed, and we are hoping for the best. <laughs> you are watching Channel One News Check, uh, and remember, we also have our viewpoint question uh, that I kindly would want you to respond to. What more should be done to protect our trees, rivers, and safeguard against air pollution? What do you think should be done? Of course, I've seen... Um, Elijah Kimani wa Kandara, you're watching from Kandara Idiru Muranga. But let's first of all take a quick break. We'll be right back for your comments, suggestions, or even where you are watching us from. Uh, kindly hit us up on all. Let's take that break. As some parts of Africa are struggling with active conflicts and new ones emerging, there are concerns that this is undermining an effective response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Vulnerable communities caught in the conflicts struggle to access healthcare, leaving them exposed to the virus that has claimed many lives across the continent. So what are the challenges of containing a disease outbreak in a conflict zone? What can be done to save lives in fragile areas? Are there lessons that can be learned from the Ebola response in the rest of DRC? The stages set for the next football star from Africa to emerge at the Under-20 Africa Cup of Nations. Watch all the games live on KBC Channel 1 as 12 countries battle out for the ultimate prize of becoming champions of Africa. Raw talent, raw skills, ultimate technique. From Africa's finest and capped talent, witness footballing dreams come alive at the Under-20 Africa Cup of Nations from 14th of February to 6th of March 2021, live from Mauritania and exclusively on KBC Channel 1, your true sports partner. Tonight on KBC Channel 1. Well, since Max has just left for Italy, this is your chance for Mauro to notice your talent. But why, Mother? Why is it that Maximilian always has my father's attention, even without, even without trying? Be a man and have the courage for once in your life to face the consequences and don't blame me. Now speak. Speak, I said. Tell me which one of the Montesinos knows about the secret. Tell me. <laughs> one of your Montesino stepbrothers. <laughs> this weekend, on KBC Channel One. If you like, take me to high court, sue me, or take me to go to Papua. Well, until everything comes back to normal, we just have to make do. Teacher, that is unacceptable. Hmm? This is not what we signed up for. Eh? This environment is worse than approved food. <laughs> you mean you still bruised over that mud incident? Grow up. 
What, did you have a bad fight? I wish I could do that. If you ask any man if he has gossiped before, he will answer with a loud vehement no. Yes. But of course we know that is not true. Men gossip. Classmates, every Saturday on KBC. Welcome back, and in case you just joined us, this is Channel 1 News Check. My name is Ben Troenjo, and Simon Mora is helping us with the sign language interpretation. And today we are looking at matters conservation, and uh, we are privileged to be hosting Dr. Juliette Biao, who is the Director, United Nations Environment Assembly Africa Office. We're trying to put into perspective some of the issues that we are seeing in uh, so many countries, climate change, nature, we have become enemies of nature and also a lot, a lot of pollution. And when we, we talk about Kenya, Kenya is one of the countries that have been, uh, has been also in the forefront holding UNEP offices. Of course, we have also to be uh, very vigilant when it comes to matters environment conservation. But for now, let's cross over to the Panafric Hotel where the sports personality of the year awards, you do remember that they will be held this Saturday and the chairman of the National Olympic Committee of Kenya, that is Paul Tergat, who is also the founder, uh, is currently addressing the press. We are hugely indebted to you all uh, for your generous support and investment into, into our sportsmen and women who are the tremendous ambassadors of this uh, great and beautiful nation of Kenya. I once again welcome you to join us, uh, especially to all of you uh, that uh, we are here, we are able to make uh, so that you can be together and prop in, in Aifasha for uh, this uh, great, as uh, Mbaisi and Kablicha said, will be a great opportunity for our young people to, to get more enlightened in how life should be. Because I want to say this, that uh, even some of us uh, that uh, we've been in sports for many years, uh, we realize that um, uh, many young people, as much as they retire, they are competing so hard now, and when they retire, because they, they, are, they are never empowered well enough. So when they retire, they retire with everything and we realize that they, they don't have anything to look back, uh, uh, to look home and write home about, about after serving the sport, after serving the nation for so many years. And I believe this is what we want us uh, to see to that we, every now and then we are engaging our young people, our sportsmen, to see to that they invest, they get proper, uh, professional advices uh, from various people from who have uh, been in the business for long so that uh, they can be able to save for their retirement and for tomorrow. Because uh, this is why um, even the, for when this pandemic it, it the first thing is that uh, the number of calls uh, which was coming in uh, was postmen who were among the first ones who are calling uh, to be assisted and it was uh, it hit me that uh, something might have gone wrong somewhere. And I believe that uh, if we can be able maybe to do that together, then uh, we are going to support uh, these young people going forward. So with these few remarks, again, I want to say thank you very much. And um, I'm happy uh, to see members of Forte State. Uh, I haven't seen you for, for, for a while. And you have come in big numbers, and I believe that uh, it shows that uh, sports is actually uh, coming back in a big way and uh, we will be able maybe to enjoy our sports again uh, going forward. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kablich. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, 
uh, former athlete Paul Tergat uh, giving a brief on the upcoming Sports Personality Awards that will be held this Saturday. And of course, uh, we have a reporter there who will brief us more on what to expect on this great day and especially for our sporting uh, for sporting boys and girls, Kenya being one of the powerhouses when it comes to sporting activities. But back to our discussion, we are discussing matters environment, and uh, we uh, will be having the fifth United Nations Environment Assembly uh, Summit. But this year, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, it will be held virtually from the 22nd to the 23rd uh, of this month. Uh, and uh, we have Dr. Juliet Biao, who is the Director, UN Environment Assembly, Nairobi, uh, I mean, Africa office, but based here in Nairobi, where the UNEP offices are also situated. And before we had that short break, we had a viewpoint question, and perhaps you can respond to the same, how we can actually uh, improve on uh, matters um, uh, climate change, pollution, and nature as individuals ourselves. I thank you so much, uh, Ben. Uh, I, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, you know <coughs> it takes really uh, individual, you know, ch uh, change of behavior at individual level. Mm -hmm. um, the government cannot do everything on this matter. It takes just simple good behavior toward nature mm -hmm. to change, to change, uh, 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 to improve on environmental matters. It also takes good policy in place. It takes law enforcement. As I discussed uh, uh, the, the Bamako Convention earlier, yes. you know, African member states ratify so many multilateral agreements. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to enforce the law, this is where we have a problem. We have a problem when, in yeah, implementation. In implementation. It seems to be a common problem. So we need now, time is for, is for action now. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we cannot, in an African country, where we have over 60% of people being young, mm -hmm. We cannot do without the youth. The young people also need to change their mentality because mm. young people want uh, money and now. Yes. I just want to tell them that they can make money in a more sustainable way mm -hmm. if they integrate the environmental dimension. Mm -hmm. We know that they have good skills mm -hmm. in, 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 in digital uh, matters. That's why. You know, United Nations Environment Program also put emphasis on the digital space. So this is the chance of the youth now. Mm -hmm. And of course the youth will play a key role yeah. in the same. I, I was down at the coast uh, sometimes back in uh, last year and I was amazed on how the coral reefs have been destroyed and we have seen very few efforts in the restorations of this great ecosystem. Yes, unfortunately, but you know, um, this is uh, awareness raising it will be key. Uh, and this is why, you know, UNEP will not stop bringing the science to tell member states to draw their attention on the fact that their environment is being degraded and to the extent to which is being degraded. Mm -hmm. UNEP is also kind of uh, uh, supporting mm -hmm. on, you know, policy decision that will kind of help to address those issues. So. Um, we just need really to work together. Mm -hmm. We need to build partnership, strategic partnership, because the government alone cannot do everything. As I say, as I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. the private sector has a role to play. The young people with the creativity mm -hmm. have also the role to play. We've seen mm -hmm. so many innovations during COVID-19. We need to build on that, we need to scale up, mm -hmm. we need also to find financial resources 
to scale up those initiatives in the post-COVID uh, uh, era. Mm -hmm. I, I know this is off the hook, but what happens to countries? We've signed so many treaties regarding uh, climate change and regarding pollution. So many countries have come together and signed treaties. What happens if they don't follow these treaties? I really uh, yes. don't want to think <laughs> of yes, the I'm situation yes. where they don't follow. Uh -huh. uh, even if uh, there are countries who uh, did not intend to follow, mm -hmm. I think COVID-19 is a kind of a wake-up call mm -hmm. for those countries. I want to believe that they will follow. Mm -hmm. And I want also uh, to reiterate uh, the support of the United Nations Environment Program for them really to follow. And this is really our responsibility uh, to all the, the, the not, not even the future generation, mm -hmm. even the current generation. We have this duty uh, um, um, with, the, uh, with those the generation, especially now that uh, um, COVID-19 has shown us our fragility. Mm -hmm. COVID-19 mm -hmm. now has shown us that we cannot do without reconciling mm -hmm. with the nature. Uh -huh. And of course, we need to use green energy, and we, also we should also try to conserve the environment. How does Africa rank in terms of continents? Because we are right here in Africa, and so many countries are, third <coughs> uh, are, are, are developing countries in terms of climate change, in terms of uh, nature conservation, and in terms of avoiding pollution. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, uh, earlier when you said that uh, African countries are not really showing progress, I said, mm -hmm. you know, I, I did not concur because I know that many countries are, do, are really uh, um, uh, doing a lot of efforts in, in advancing um, um, environment, environment mm -hmm. uh, environmental dimension of the sustainable development goal, mm -hmm. especially through uh, uh, promoting renewable energy. Uh, there are at least uh, um, uh, 10 countries that I know that they are really uh, working towards promoting renewable energy, with, uh, uh, including Morocco. Mm -hmm. Morocco is doing a lot, and I know that Kenya yeah. here uh -huh. is also taking uh, the lead, especially on geothermal. Yes. Yeah. So uh, what, what I think what we need is uh, uh, to communicate more on the successes for other countries to emulate those countries who are really uh, uh, doing doing well, and uh, this is the, the the moment to do that. And we, as Africa office, mm -hmm. we will be working on it. Even on the ban of the, the ban of, of plastic you mentioned. Yes. Do you know that about 20 countries have banned plastic in Africa? 20 countries. 20 countries. That's good. But problems. they are not at the same level in mm -hmm. terms of enforcing the law. So mm -hmm. our role as Africa office now is really to share those information mm -hmm. across the continent, for you know. Uh, countries, other countries who are not there to emulate, and for countries who have banned and have not made progress in enforcing the law to really learn from those who have succeeded. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And uh, you've had a checkered career in matters conservation. You've also been a minister in your own country mm -hmm. of environment. But uh, looking at uh, so many governments, when it comes to implementing policies, it's becoming a big challenge. Why is that? Um, I think... Uh, uh, in my humble opinion, mm -hmm. is uh, really because uh, they are what the level of awareness is not where it ought to be. Mm -hmm. This is number one. The second one is that environment has always been seen as really hindering mm -hmm. really businesses. Mm -hmm. Even with the private sector, mm -hmm. when you start discussing environmental issues, mm -hmm. when the first thing they will think about is, oh, Mm -hmm. They want to really to put a kind of barrier to, to my business. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of understanding that environment offers opportunities mm -hmm. for private sector, for government, for civil society, and for each individual. Mm -hmm. So we will continue our advocacy role at the global level and this is our mandate as united nations environment program mm -hmm. for people to understand how important is the environment environment 
is the life, you know. Mm -hmm. The air we are breathing, mm -hmm. if it is polluted, we cannot be healthy. Mm -hmm. The nature, the natural resources are the foundation of, uh, uh, you know, the the economy in, uh, in, in Africa, you know. If, uh, if we keep watching our natural resources being degraded, then what's become our livelihood? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, so we need to be... Uh, so this is uh, where the role of uh, uh, the United Nations Environment Program as a central coordinator mm -hmm or for the member state efforts in advancing uh, the environmental dimension of sustainable de development is, is crucial. Mm -hmm. We will continue to, to do that. And other than uh, uh, implementation challenges by various, perhaps various governments, what are other challenges that uh, we are experiencing and of course you are experiencing as UNEA and uh, as UNEP in uh, addressing climate change, pollution and uh, of course uh, achieving that or agitating for a clean environment that we live in. You see, when, when uh, you hear the member states uh, really uh, kind of sharing the challenges they are facing in implementing all those actions, mm. uh, the first thing you will hear is finance. Uh. Financial resources. Mm -hmm. Personally, I believe that with great ideas, huh? mm -hmm. with innovation, Mm -hmm. We can overcome even financial uh, the, the lack uh, the uh, lack of financial resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have resources in our countries, mm -hmm. of course. And the good thing you said that we don't need money fast. We need first of all to change uh, how we mentalities, behavior. Yeah. Stop doing business as usual, mm -hmm. innovating, and then the rest will come. Mm -hmm. If we continue, uh, uh, really. Uh, uh, complaining about financial resources, then my question will be, what has uh, the, 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 the recommendation of uh, the 2015 uh, uh, conference on finance for development has become? I know that this conference, uh, the, during this conference, uh, the member state has agreed that the re mobilization, mobilization of domestic resources is critical. African countries cannot continue to rely on uh, on the the, uh, the foreign assistance. Cooperation and international cooperation is is important, and that is what the uh, 17th uh, 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 develop, uh, sustainable development goals is saying. Mm -hmm. But. If you look at what is happening with the COVID-19 today, all the countries are affected. Yes. All the countries are drawing the, the, the stimulus recovery pack package, mm -hmm. which, is, which says that we talk about the effort that each member state in Africa has to do domestically before thinking about international uh, 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 foreign assistance. Mm -hmm. And of course, we'll be talking about, we'll be touching about uh, UNEP is celebrating 50, 50 years yeah. uh, this year. Um, some of the biggest successes that you've had and uh, what are you planning for for, 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 for the new celebration? Yeah, uh, UNEP at 50 is uh, uh, really the comments to discuss how, uh, how uh, we can look back mm -hmm. to the UNEP uh, of uh, 50 years ago and also see um, what effort can we can do. Uh, you need to improve our natural resources to improve the environment. And uh, Kenya as a host mm -hmm. of uh, the UN Environment uh, Program mm -hmm. is playing a key role at the forefront. Mm -hmm. So the discussion really uh, uh, will start during this online session mm -hmm. uh, through the resume UNEA 2 in 2020. Mm -hmm. And if it, it will even go uh, beyond uh, to, to, to really uh, be examined also on, uh, during the World Environment uh, Day on uh, 5th of June. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the discussion has started already mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, Kenya is uh, discussing with other African member states 
how they will make this uh, event a special one to increase Africa's visibility. Mm -hmm. But uh, beyond increasing the visibility, mm -hmm. what really matters is what are really the key activities that will be uh, really carried out to make sure that, yes, this awareness raising has reached the level we, we, we want it to be. And uh, so that, uh, you know, countries which has really made tremendous effort can be emulated by those who are still lagging behind. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody had asked me just, I was getting in to ask you, what is the benefit of having UNEP offices right here in Kenya? <laughs> <laughs> because it's one of the, well, actually it's one of the... First of all, let me... Okay. Let okay. me before then, before then, hold the thought, hold the thought. Uh, the the C educations sorry health CS Mutai Kagwe is currently having a presser. Let's uh, dash there and know exactly what he's talking about. It's an uh, important in event to inaugurate Kenya's first ever end malaria council. Last year, upon taking over the chairmanship of the Africa Leaders Malaria Alliance, His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta called for the establishment of country-led malaria councils and funds as part of his legacy agenda towards the elimination of malaria and on the African continent. Today, we fulfill His Excellency's call to action with the unveiling of Kenya's End Malaria Council. This council is the fifth to be launched in the African continent after Eswatini, Uganda, Zambia, and Mozambique. It will play a very critical role in mobilizing local resources to drive the agenda of malaria control and elimination in Kenya in a much more sustainable way. According to the World Health Organization's World Malaria Report 2020, and I recognize and appreciate the presence of uh, the local representative, Rudy Egas, there were 215 malaria million, 215 million malaria cases and 384,000 malaria deaths in Africa in 2019. It concerns us, therefore, that malaria incident rates in Africa has plateaued since 2015 when it was expected to be on a downward trend. Consequently, Africa is not on track to achieve its 2020 target of reducing malaria incidence and mortality by 40% and the goal of eliminating malaria by 2030. Whilst it's true for the national average, the burden of malaria is not spread evenly across our great country. The greatest burden, as was ably demonstrated here in the presentation, is in Busia and Siaya, where incidence is more than six times higher than the national average. Many factors account for this, but perhaps none so much more than the presence of extensive number of breeding sites near homesteads. To mitigate against this, we plan to accelerate efforts that will include application of measures to spray and kill mosquito larvae at the source in these counties during the second quarter of this calendar year. And to ensure that those two and other counties also address other aspects aimed at fighting malaria, His Excellency the President recently launched the use of malaria scorecard, which will aid health workers and community members in identifying factors that could be responsible for increased numbers of cases. Once these are identified, it will be easy then to develop effective and targeted preventive measures. The year 2020, as everybody knows, 
was a terrible year we could wish to forget. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed our lives in an unprecedented manner. The pandemic provided another challenge in the noble fight against malaria. At the onset of the pandemic, the World Health Organization predicted a doubling of malaria deaths in severe disruptions to insecticide-treated net campaigns and access to anti-malaria medicines were experienced. Although Kenya continues to experience public health and socioeconomic impact, as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, I'm delighted to say that through commendable efforts by the government and its development partners, this predicted doubling in malaria deaths was averted. We ensured the continued distribution of insecticide-treated bed nets, the availability of medicines at our health facilities, and indoor residue spraying took place as planned whilst COVID-19 protocols were being observed. As noble and esteemed leaders have remarked, the true measure, and I quote, the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members, end of quote. By ensuring that all Kenyans, and especially children and pregnant women, have access to life-saving medicines, insecticide-treated mosquito nets, and other commodities, we took and indeed continue to take steps forward. One of the key bottlenecks we have encountered during the COVID-19 pandemic has been the difficulty in securing essential health commodities, including malaria diagnostics, treatments, and vector control tools in a timely manner, especially when these have been manufactured outside our country. We must work together to ensure that those commodities are manufactured locally here in Kenya. By promoting local manufacturing, we shall reduce reliance on foreign manufactured malaria supplies and ensure economic development as well as easy access and timely delivery of these essential commodities to the populations at risk of malaria. Let me make a special appeal here, particularly to our development partners and those who contribute with us, you saw the percentage of contribution that comes from uh, our donor community. But I want to make a special appeal that they lay emphasis as well on local manufactured products and local manufactured pharmaceutical products. And I'll tell you why I'm making this special appeal. It's because on several occasions when we ask why is it that we cannot buy locally manufactured materials. We know, for example, that there are organizations that have been exporting outside of Kenya to other countries, and yet we in Kenya are not buying from them. And these are Kenyan organizations. It just doesn't make sense. But we are told that some of these situations is because of the donor, condition, the, the donor uh, conditions where you have got to go for a global tender, even when these things are being manufactured here in our country. And I want to make a special appeal to our, to our funding partners that whenever we have got these products locally, please let us buy from our local manufacturers. <laughs> and two things happen immediately. One of them is that we are able to move these commodities quickly, and secondly, we provide jobs. We give jobs to our people. Whenever you order a million, two million nets to be manufactured outside Kenya and brought into Kenya, you have just exported some 5,000 jobs. And if, something, if there is one thing I know we need in this country, it's jobs. The other thing we are told is that the process by which the World Health Organization, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm happy that Rudy, you are here, that the process by which the World Health Organization gives approvals because the, 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 the funding agencies tell us we can't buy because the World Health Organization 
has not given, has not recommended that product. And the process by which the World Health Organization takes in order for them to approve a commodity, apparently, is so rigorous that uh, some of our people are unable uh, to meet those standards. And we don't want to compromise, of course, we don't want to compromise on, uh, um, on the kind of quality of product that uh, we have. But we have learned through the PPEs that we are making in our country today, we have learned that these things are possible. And therefore, I would like to request also the World Health Organization to look at the issue of fast tracking, where local manufacturers can be assisted and where local manufacturers can be given priority. Because uh, what we saw this year, and we have continued to see it, is that uh, unless we are locally, um, unless we rely on ourselves locally, we will continue to be challenged. Take the current issue of vaccines. It is not that we don't have the money to buy vaccines, but the vaccines are still not available to us. Why? Because obviously the country is making those vaccines. We will give priority to those national, they will give priority to national interests before they ever come to, uh, to us. So it's absolutely critical. And I want to challenge the council. I want to challenge the donor community. I want to challenge the World Health Organization that we give priority for the local manufacturing aspect. And uh, as a, a government and as a cabinet, we have pronounced ourselves on this matter that at least the Kenya part of the funding will definitely go to local manufacturers. We also want to appeal to the local manufacturers to up their game in terms of quality, to ensure that the quality that we have of products in our nation are absolutely at best practice globally. So COVID-19 is also a stark reminder of the impact of disease on our socioeconomic development. This is also true of malaria. Past studies have demonstrated that malaria reduces economic growth by up to 1.3% each year, and estimates suggest that workers miss nearly 12 million days of work each year in Kenya because of malaria. This is equivalent to removing the productivity of some 50,000 workers from our economy. Similarly, malaria reduces academic achievement and causes children to miss upwards of 3% of their schooling. A healthy economy requires healthy and educated workers, especially as we look forward to the recovery following the ongoing pandemic. To succeed in our mission to end malaria, we must address financial resource gaps that have been demonstrated here by the able presenters. And what uh, Githuka said about the resource gap of 24 billion to fully implement our current malaria strategic plan, which covers between 2019 and 2023 is indeed a challenge. We must close this gap to ensure that we have the required malaria supplies to not only treat malaria, but effectively prevent it in the first place. And I want to emphasize that, the issue of prevention. And it is not just malaria, as a ministry, the philosophy and policy that we have, ad that have, we had, we have adopted is one of prevention, prevention, prevention. Primary health care, our public health effort is going to be intensified at the prevention level. Therefore, if you looked at uh, the gap uh, that was here, for example, uh, the issue of intervention, spraying, and what have you, there was a huge gap of uh, financing and funding. Yet, that is our top priority. We had rather prevent disease than cure disease. There has been too much emphasis on the curative aspects uh, as opposed to the prevention aspects. And what we have seen is with hygiene measures, even during the COVID-19 period, it is possible to reduce the disease burden by working more at prevention than at uh, curing. So we must expand our outreach in affected communities to ensure that everyone has the knowledge 
to protect themselves and their families against malaria. My hope is that this council will prioritize working and supporting community-led initiatives. This council, as you have seen for yourselves, is a public-private community partnership. Its members, as introduced, are senior leaders drawn from government, the private sector, civil society, and research institutions. Each and every one of you has unique experience and capabilities that will contribute significantly to the fight against malaria. This council is not a replacement of the National Malaria Program, which will remain primarily responsible for the technical implementation of the National Malaria Strategy. Instead, the council will advocate for malaria to remain high on the strategic agenda across all sectors of the government, the private sector, civil society, and sensitize all leaders to the importance of ending malaria. This council will drive action by the various sectors to support the implementation of Kenya's malaria strategy. This council will establish and manage a fund and can receive, manage and disburse financial and in-kind donations from various sectors to close the budget gap under the Kenya malaria strategy. You'll also establish and implement transparent process to receive contributions, invest available resources, and receive funding requests from the counties and malaria programs. You prioritize actions towards promoting and strengthening the local manufacture of malaria control commodities and supplies and identify priority activities for funding. This council will use their unique experience and capabilities to drive innovation and make malaria elimination more efficient sustainable and achievable. And finally, this council will promote mutual accountability between the sectors for the successful implementation of the National Malaria Strategic Plan and elimination of malaria by 2030. To support these efforts, my ministry, through the National Malaria Program, will provide quarterly updates to the council members on the status of malaria control and elimination and the gaps and bottlenecks that the country faces. We will also share the national and subnational malaria scorecards and work plans to ensure that the End Malaria Council work in a focused and evidence-based approach. Council members, it's so important that we eradicate malaria completely. And why so? Because by doing so, the many deaths occasioned by malaria will be avoided and more people will become more productive in the growth of our country's economy. Further, eradication of malaria will free the capacity of our health workers to address health conditions that cannot be avoided and also strengthen the resilience of our health system. It is therefore with great pleasure and privilege that I now inaugurate Kenya's End Malaria Council and charge its founding members to do the country proud by laying a strong foundation towards the elimination of malaria in Kenya. Zero malaria starts with me and with all of us. Asanteni sana nakazi kwenu. Thank you all very much. Indeed, a very comprehensive report there by the CS for Health, Mutahi Kagwe, and especially when he talks about matters of malaria. He talks about malaria. 
uh, eradication or zero malaria starts with you and me. Of course, he has talked about some of the milestones the government has been able uh, to achieve when it comes to the uh, control of malaria. Of course, we have the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, also other diseases like malaria have to be checked as well. And of course, he has officially launched the Malaria Council, urging them to help us kick this disease out of Kenya it's one of the killer diseases that kills a lot of children and pregnant mothers here in the country. And, uh, of course, if we put all our efforts together, we will be able to succeed in that endeavor. Coming back to our discussion, in case you joined us, this news check, and we are talking about matters conservation, and especially when we are just about uh, to host the fifth United Nations Environment Assembly, and we have uh, Dr. Juliet Diao, who is the Director, United Nations Environment Assembly, Africa Office. And uh, just before uh, we went to CS Mutahi Kagwe, we were talking about the United Nations Environment Program is actually this year celebrating 50 years of existence. Congratulations and happy birthday. Thank you, Ben. Uh, the celebration uh, is, uh, we are preparing for celebration, for the celebration, and it's, uh, it's Kenya taking the leadership on that, and good leadership uh, to, to really help uh, uh, on the preparation of UNEP at 50. I think, uh, uh, in uh, every um, initiative that you undertake, you want to step back, you want to look back, and really uh, assess your progress. Yes. UNEP at, at 50 is coming at a particular moment of COVID-19, mm -hmm. where really something has been broken between people and nature. Mm -hmm. And that will really give another sense to the, this UNEP uh, at 50. Mm -hmm. And having Kenya, the host of U the United Nations Environment Program, playing a leadership role mm -hmm. to really kind of rally the whole world on a common noble cause, it's a pride for Africa. Uh -huh. Uh, though it is, uh, it is uh, uh, being led by Kenya, mm -hmm. it is not only an African thing. It is really a, a, an event that really involves the whole world. And as I mentioned, it is a pride for Africa yes. to see Kenya being leading this initiative. Um, as I said, um, the discussions have started during this online uh, UNEA section. It will go through the resume UNEA 2 uh, in uh, 2020 mm -hmm. and also at the, the World Environment Day on 5th of June. Mm -hmm. Currently, uh, the, the member states are discussing mm -hmm. what what will this special event could look like? And what are the activities that will really help to raise more awareness on the environment? Mm -hmm. So uh, we are really uh, working under the leadership of the Kenyan government on that. Yeah. And talking about uh, taking a leadership, last year you had a green stimulus program. Can you kindly comment on it? No, we didn't have a green stimulus uh, program mm -hmm. standalone event per se. Mm -hmm. What we had mm -hmm. was the eighth special session mm -hmm. of the African Ministerial Conference on the Environment mm -hmm. where the African Green Stimulus Package uh, yes. program uh -huh. was discussed and adopted. Uh -huh. And I spoke about it. Uh -huh. uh, in my uh, and 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 still on uh, the Bamako convention, perhaps uh, we can touch on uh, some of the signatories that we have um, and who have pledged their allegiance to follow uh, each and everything that was discussed in that convention. Yeah, uh, up to date, I think we have uh, 30, 31 uh, countries that have joined, and as I mentioned earlier, just mm -hmm. within two years, we have Sierra Leone, Central African uh, uh, Republic, mm -hmm. and, and recently Morocco joining. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, even though uh, Kenya has not yet joined, 
uh, Kenya government is thinking about joining it because mm -hmm. Kenyan has given a, a, a very wonderful example on the ban of plastic mm -hmm. that uh, other countries in the world are emulating now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there is a, 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 a close relationship between the, the, the plastic uh, waste and also, uh, you know, when we talk about the, the, the Bamako Convention oh, on yes. the, the waste and hazardous waste, mm -hmm. I think uh, Kenya is, uh, it will be willing also to join. We are really ready to, to provide any kinds of support for to see Kenyan joining. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also because Kenya is the host of the United Nations Environment Program mm -hmm. and that the world is watching Kenya yes. mm -hmm. on, on, on uh, really uh, all the initiative that they are taking on the environment. And I have to say mm -hmm. that good le leadership is being taken by the Kenyan government. Yes, indeed, you are the Africa office head, mm -hmm. but uh, you've lived in Kenya for perhaps a while. Mm. What are some of the things that you've seen us uh, do right when it comes to conservation of, en of the environment or what are some of the things that we really need to improve as a country when it comes to environment conservation? And uh, of course I will, I will still pose the same question I had posed earlier on what are the benefits of us hosting the United Nations Environment Program headquarters right here in Nairobi. Look, I, 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 as I mentioned earlier, mm. You know, making peace with nature takes simple individual action. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've been living here in Kenya for more than five years now. Yes. I was on leave in my country. After a week, I start missing Kenya. <laughs> because yes. of mm. this good weather, Okay. because of the good environment here in, in Kenya. Because when I wake up in my own country, when I see people throwing waste here and there, really mm -hmm. the behavior toward the environment is really shocking. Mm -hmm. Kenya, you don't have it. Mm -hmm. This is the reason why when I move away from Kenya, yes. I really miss Kenya. No, just, uh, you know, uh, on a serious note, Yes. Kenya is among the countries where you can see is really uh, a forest in a city. This air that we are breathing is clean. This is not to say Kenya is not only Nairobi. Yes. Kenya is also uh, other countries and in the countryside. Mm -hmm. So Kenya is doing really well on environmental matters. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, a, it is fair to, to see that uh, uh, Kenya is given really um, the host of, of for the United Nations Environment Program. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think Kenya will demonstrate once more their leadership on environmental matters through this unit of 50, mm -hmm. because they will be rallying the whole world yeah. uh, around this noble cause on mm -hmm. the environment. Mm -hmm. And um, first of March this year, you want to launch a transport unit? No, 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 no. We have a transport union that just mentioned that uh, we will be launching electric motors. The, we will be happy really to have you yes, during this event so that we can share more information in detail on that. Perhaps you can touch more on that uh, transport unit because I'm quite sure you are you near. So at least it has to be very, very air friendly, right? Yeah, but th this transport unit is really uh, looking at, uh, you know, uh, beating pollution through really, uh, um, you know, the transport has a lot of, uh, uh, contributes a lot to, to, to the pollution. So uh, the transport unit is, uh, is uh, the unit that is related to our economy division mm -hmm. who is uh, working on this matter. We as a regional office are supporting them to really raise awareness of a member state and to also help them to set up uh, uh, to establish some policies that uh, really can help the countries to move toward environment friendly really uh, uh, policies and uh, to, to beat pollution. And I think my colleagues, you have the opportunity to talk with Rob, yes. who is the head of this unit at the right moment. Uh -huh. uh, another thing, the laws that member states have and the policies regarding environmental conservation 
Should anything be changed so that we may aspire to have the nature that you're talking about, a clean nature that will be friendly to everyone? I, I don't think that we should, uh, we, we can really uh, talk about a change of policies where it is necessary to reinforce taking in, into consideration the lessons that we've learned mm -hmm. uh, uh, through the uh, COVID-19 pandemic mm -hmm. and also the opportunities mm -hmm. that we were able to seize uh, during this COVID pandemic can help us to reinforce uh, uh, the, 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 the policies that exist. Even the African Green Stimulus Program that uh, you know I've talked about, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, is not something that is new, you know. Mm -hmm. It uh, intends really to reinforce existing green and blue economy uh, uh, initiative as well as the climate change initiative that exists. So yes, there is a possibility to really look into uh, areas that need, need new interventions. Mm -hmm. What we need to change is really how we do business we cannot continue doing business as usual. What needs to change also is to see how we can seize the opportunity of the digital space that is being created now to really rally our young people. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Kenya is one of the member states when you talk about UNEP and as you've said that we are actually uh, on the right track when it comes to matters conservation but a lot also needs to be done. The government did start an afforestation, an ambitious afforestation program right here in the country, and other countries seem to have followed suit. Uh, what, can you talk, what can you say about the, those efforts, and um, what are we looking at when it comes to five, ten years, if we continue uh, with that uh, good gesture? Uh, I think what you're talking about is uh, the Greening Kenya Initiative. Mm -hmm where uh, UNEP is called to take also uh, a kind of leadership with, uh, of course, <laughs> to take some responsibility under the leadership mm -hmm. of the cabinet secretary on yes. forestry. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Kenya has set up an objective for at least 10% uh, forest recovery by 2030. Mm -hmm. And they are really, really doing tremendous effort to, to achieve this goal. And we, as UNEP, we are really supporting, not only as UNEP, mm -hmm. but as the UN family, because we are working with other uh, relevant UN agencies to support uh, uh, Kenya in, in, in this effort. Yeah. And uh, are there any modern methods of conservation? Looking at uh, five years that you've been in the country, uh, of course, a lot of things are changing, including technology. So what would you say about what is happening, all the modern now methods uh, that are being used here in Africa uh, to actually achieve a green uh, and perhaps a blue uh, economy well? Because looking at uh, so many Africa, Africans, are using perhaps charcoal, they are using, others are using a few fossil fuels. Mm. And of course, they, they also uh, contribute to pollution in, the, in, in Africa. I think uh, uh, we uh, need, as I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. a lot is going on in terms of innovation. Mm -hmm. And COVID-19 pandemic has really opened, really offered Opportunity, a great opportunity for innovation. Mm -hmm. There are innovation in many, many areas, mm -hmm. and many key areas. Look at, looking, uh, just looking at uh, uh, the sector of energy, there are more innovative cooks of mm -hmm. in some countries. There are other tec uh, technologies that have been adopted really to cope with the situation. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is really to kind of uh, uh, shed the light on, on this uh, innovation and gather information and share it across the continent so that, uh, you know, we can scale up, we can have other countries em emulated. Mm -hmm. And um, I know this is off the cuff, but mm -hmm. 
a lot of African countries want to start using nuclear energy, just like other developed countries have. But of course, there are, are challenges here and there, and of course, some objections. Mm -hmm. What do you do say about nuclear energy in Africa? Uh, you see, uh, UNEP is not really kind of uh, what we are working on so far, mm -hmm. is uh, solar energy, mm -hmm. wind energy, mm -hmm. Geothermal, and as I said, t Kenya is mm -hmm. taking the lead on, on, on geothermal, mm -hmm. and also what kind of energy, and uh, by, by no, biomass so, yes. also is an energy. Uh -huh. So uh, I, I wouldn't really uh, say much about mm -hmm. the nuclear energy because uh, uh, as UNEP we are, we are not really kind of, I, I think this discussion has mm -hmm. to come at a certain level yes. with the, the um, International Energy Agency. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, we are hoping for the best when it comes to that. That is why I actually told you it's mm -hmm. off the cuff mm -hmm. when we talk about energy, and especially in Africa, where a lot of uh, Africans are using fuels mm -hmm. that actually aid mm -hmm. in pollution mm -hmm. of the environment. During the Bamako uh, Convention, there were some of the things that were were, were touched when it comes to Africa, all the African countries that are member states. Mm -hmm. And uh, they all alluded that uh, they are going to be following what some of the resolutions that you came up with. Mm. Looking at uh, the resolutions that you made for these three uh, crucial uh, parameters, that is climate change, nature, and pollution, mm. where can you rank Africa? You are the African head. Mm. Where can you rank Africa in terms of other developed countries? I, you know, as a regional office for Africa, although it is uh, this kind of comparison mm -hmm. is, is necessary at some point, yes. I'm more focused about having all the member states uh, really uh, making uh, progress on this uh, uh, environmental matters than mm -hmm. really start uh, comparing with uh, mm -hmm. a developed country. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing, that, uh, la, 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 one thing that can, that wa, wa, what thing that I do mm -hmm. as a regional office for Africa mm -hmm. is really to, to, to share information about good practices good practices uh, that have been really adopted in some countries and also uh, for, for other countries that are lagging behind mm -hmm. to emulate uh, those countries who have succeeded, mm -hmm. maybe that mm -hmm. can also create a kind of competition, mm -hmm. but it's, it's would, it would be a healthy competition. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, when it comes to now you living here as a Kenyan, uh, mm. let, me, let me call you a Kenyan for now, mm. and um, what is it that you can advise us as Kenyans when it comes to matters environmental conservation as we wind up? The only advice I, I can really uh, give mm -hmm. is that Kenya should continue mm -hmm. uh, on, uh, on uh, you know, the, 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 mm -hmm. the, path, the, the, the right path that, that they have taken mm -hmm. to achieve sustainable development. I, I have to say really honestly that Kenya, Kenya is on the right, the right track. Mm -hmm. And I know that, uh, you know, Kenya also uh, uh, knows that uh, you know the world is is really watching Kenya as a host of uh, of uh, uh, the United Nations Environment Program. Mm -hmm. So they are doing well, and they just need to do to do more, to scale up, and to be able really uh, to to build a more resilient uh, uh, and, and and more. Uh, more resilient uh, uh, community, mm -hmm. you know, due to to really kind of overcome the shock that uh, uh, the shock of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. Really, uh, it's a pride really yeah. to have uh, you know an African country hosting yes. this uh, global, I will say, yes. global institution, uh -huh. uh, and and being able mm -hmm. to rally all the uh, uh, the world mm -hmm. around this cause. It's a mm -hmm. pride. Uh -huh. uh, uh, kindly speak to this camera uh, on uh, the fifth, uh, final words, on the fifth uh, United Nations Environment Assembly and of course the UNEP at 50 as we wind up. Yes, um, the United Nations Environment Program, uh, the United Nations Environment Assembly mm -hmm. is the highest decision making body 
on the global environment. It meets biennially, and we are currently uh, really running the fifth session of the United Nations Environment Assembly here in uh, 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 the, the member states have agreed to have two-step approach due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are currently running the online session, uh, which is uh, really to be held on 22nd to 23rd of February uh, this year. During this session, uh, only really urgent matters such as the approval, uh, uh, the ad adoption of uh, the medium term strategy, the program of work, and the budget will really uh, be examined during this online session. And uh, there will be also a launch of uh, a synthesis uh, report on making peace with nature, uh, which really is a, a, a comprehensive blueprint to address the three key crises, climate change, nature, and pollution, and to secure sustainable uh, uh, development uh, and also to build resilient uh, and inclusive post-COVID world. Uh, finally, um, this um, a, a leadership dialogue uh, will also be organized to really explain how the environmental dimension contribute to sustainable development goals and to build also a resilient and uh, an inclusive post-COVID world. Uh, the second session of UNEA will, res uh, UNEA will resume uh, in 2020, uh, 22, where countries will have the opportunity to discuss issues that require negotiation. So uh, as I said earlier, UNEP up 50 will be an opportunity for member states, the whole world, not only African countries, to look back uh, to uh, UNEP uh, 50 years ago and uh, to really seize, you know, the opportunities of uh, the COVID-19, whether it has affected us or have offered some opportunities to kind of recommit to really uh, improve our environment uh, for, you know, both nature and people to gain from, from, from uh, the benefit. Uh -huh. Indeed, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I have been speaking to Dr. Juliet Bian, who is the Director, United Nations Environment mm -hmm. Assembly, Africa Office. Uh, we were talking about the fifth United Nations Environment Assembly that will be taking place, as she has said, from the 22nd to the 23rd of this month, though virtually because of COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, I hope you have learned a lot about environment conservation, and it all begins with changing your perception and loving your environment. Thank you indeed so much for watching, but uh, you do remember that uh, Easter is beckoning and today is Ash Wednesday and uh, we will be crossing over to the Holy Family Basilica uh, where the Catholic season have begun the Lent season, which will eventually climax to Easter. Indeed, thank you so much for watching. I'm Ben Troy. Enjoy. Byron Abuli has been our sign language interpreter for this morning. We may have picked elements that were not necessary to make our souls beautiful. And like a house that is now dusty, our hearts may have become dusty. And you can imagine that sometimes time is of essence. So a building that has been there for 10 years will not be the same like a building that has been there for 50, 70 years. And over the years, you can imagine with your age, each one of us here present, your ears have also done something to your soul. And therefore, this beautiful time we are given by the church is to reclaim our beauty, the beauty of our souls. And the church gives us three practices that will help to reclaim the beauty of our souls. Number one is prayer.
the church invites us to cultivate the culture of prayer and to intensify our prayer life, the dialogue between us and God. Because as you know, prayer is like going before the mirror and you are able to see where you have a fault. If you stand before a mirror, you can see where you need to rectify. In prayer, we receive the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God illumines our hearts and we become cognizant to the fact of our sins. We become conscious of our sins and therefore so in prayer we seek the forgiveness of God. So one of the uh, uh, things that will help us, one of the practices that will help us to restore the beauty of our souls is prayer. A life without prayer is like a garden that is not attended. And eventually, plants of all kind may take root. Weeds of all nature may take root. And you may lose even whatever good you had planted in that land. The second practice that the church is giving us is fasting. Fasting is self-denial. And I have said and we have heard so many other times this being remit, uh, repeated, that we are denying ourselves so that our hearts can be able to freely be lifted up to God in prayer. It is normal that even in church when you are seated like this, you can, you can experience the need to answer a call of nature. But as a human beings, you've been given the option. You can either postpone or you can go to the right place. The moment you postpone, you are exercising self-control. And self-control is what we gain when we are denying our bodies that which we know we would have afforded to give our bodies as a matter of comfort but we deny it so that we gain self-control. The church gives us the, 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 gives us the opportunity that as we fast from food, drink, and those things that you know bring us comfort and pleasure, we may be able to go into a notch higher and say no to the bodily desires that are with us. That you can be able to say no even when you know that your body is so much pressing for a certain desire or need. And therefore you tell the body, you are a servant, not the master of my mind and heart. And that is the will of God. That we should not be enslaved by our bodies, but our bodies to be servants to our minds and to our hearts. The third practice is arms giving. We not only pray, we not only fast, but we must go a notch higher. I have said that beauty, according to St. Thomas, has the glory or splendor of sharing it itself with others. When we have drawn the peace, when we have drawn the, uh, the union with God through prayer and even fasting, then automatically we gain the capacity to share ourselves with others and especially those who are needy. Almsgiving is what we have already fasted, that we may not again do like some people do. You fast the whole day, then in the evening you eat everything you would have taken. That is postponing, that is not fasting. You don't need to be postponing. But for us, it's whatever you have fasted, that it may go into charity. Somebody somewhere needs food, your hand may be extended. Somebody somewhere needs clothing. Somebody somewhere needs assistance, medical assistance. Whatever we have fasted, that it may go into fasting. Look at it this way. Beauty has to have integrity or completeness. What are the virtues that you have lost over the years? Could you have lost the virtue of patience? Could you have lost the virtue of charity? 
could you have lost the virtue of mercy and being generous? Could you have lost the, 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 the virtue of fidelity, be it in your marriage, be it in your vocation? Then you're not complete. I am not complete if I have lost one of those virtues that are necessary for one who is a Christian. Secondly, the person who I'm seeing here seated today, is it the person that you are? Is there a harmony between your appearance and what you are inside? Today all of us are appearing religious. We shall be marked with the ashes as a sign of repentance. But is it the reality in your hearts? Are we going home to be new persons, converted? If you're seated next to your husband or your wife, are you the person they are seeing? If you are a father or mother somewhere, are your children, do the, your children see the person that you are? Is there a harmony between your soul and your appearances? That is harmony. And lastly, do you have the character of glowing, shining forth? Do you inspire? Do you encourage? Do you bring life where you go? Do you make others admire your Christian life? If not, this season of Lent, reclaim your beauty. And that's, that will be a mantra that I'll repeat to the end. Let us take this time, look into ourselves. Am I complete? Do I have harmony? Do I inspire? And if not, take this moment to reclaim the beauty of your soul. That God looking at you can say, I have found my servant, the person after my own heart. Because in your private life and in your public life, there is a conformity. There is a union and you glow with a splendor that is divine. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us now all arise for the blessing of the ashes and more so for our blessings you realize we did not have the penitential right it is because the penitential right is you know omitted because we already have this ritual that is penitential in character and therefore the words will be said to us Repent and believe in the gospel. Let us pray for the grace that those words may become a reality in our lives. My dear brothers and sisters, let us humbly ask God our Father that he be pleased to bless with the abundance of his grace these ashes which will be put on our, on our foreheads as a sign of penitence. Let us pray. O oh God, who are moved by the acts of humility and respond with forgiveness to acts of penance, let your merciful ear to our prayers and in your kindness pour out the grace of your blessings upon these your servants who will be marked with these ashes as they follow the Lenten observances. May they be worthy to come with minds made pure to celebrate the Paschal mystery of your Son. And this we ask through Christ our Lord.
Na kuambia 2021 ni vitu noma na quick beat. Siku ya leo tunakupea Hisense TV. Oh yes na ni rahisi sana. Unaenda kwenye Lipa na Mpesa. Paybill number ni 4032353. 4032353. Kwenye account ekelea TV kama code kisha nambari unapenda alafu amount ni 20 bob. Thank you yake. I love kumbuka utekelea pin yako. Hivyo ndivyo utakuwa umekelea bid kwenye quickbid.co.ke. Kumbuka ni bidhaa bora kwenye bei ya chini kwa chini. Eh, hey. chini kwa chini. Jiunga na Quickbid ni rahisi. Enda kwenye Mpesa, bonyeza paybill kisha weka business number 4032353. Kwenye account weka kodi ya bidhaa unayotaka na bid yako ya chini zaidi. Kwa mfano TV16. Kisha weka shilingi 20 tu kama idadi yako. Weka bid yako pia kwenye www.quickbid.co.ke. Kumbuka, bidi ya chini zaidi ya kipekee ndio ununua. Quick bid, bidhaa bora kwa bei ya chini. Tonight on KBC Channel 1. Tende kwa kala moto. Kasikia kala moto kala moto. Na ile namba hip hop. Ni jamaa bwana akipiga shoo yake baba. Mwisho. Kala moto. Wendo yeah. kala moto. Nataka kwa kio cha jamii sio kio cha jago. Mimi nataka niwe kio cha madem. Yo 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 adi na bifu na mbingu mbona bro kwa ju ni kazi ya Mungu sio baba wa mamjuku sasa nyi wazia mavishalo baro taka mademu sisi si majanga hayo wazungu sema it's okay <laughs> 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 uh, uh. next on i feel like breaking down time after time and it keeps coming back always coming back Mungu ametufundisha adabu na mtume wetu Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam aliposema يا ايها الذين امنوا لا ترفعوا اصواتكم فوق صوت النبي ibogizo chetu leo ni kuwa waislamu ama ummati rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hawaezi kujumuika katika upotevu